Good evening. It's Monday, May 10th. Fears of another outright war between Israel and the Palestinians as Israeli jets respond to Palestinian rocket attacks with bombing Gaza. At least 13 Palestinians are reported killed. The Palestinian Prime Minister appeals for international protection after Israeli troops clashes with Palestinian Ramadan worshippers at Jerusalem's Al-Aqsa Mosque ignited the violence. I call on the international community to intervene immediately to stop these horrific violations and to provide protection to the citizens of the Palestinian territories, especially in the city of Jerusalem, which is undergoing ethnic cleansing. California Governor Gavin Newsom wants to tap an extraordinary $76 billion budget surplus to give tax rebates to millions of Californians, proposing checks of up to $1,100 for taxpayers earning $75,000 or less. That tax rebate will impact just shy of 80% of all tax filers will get a direct stimulus check. Governor Gavin Newsom expands a drought emergency declaration to a large swath of, sta- of the state amid acute water supply shortages in northern and central parts of California. The emergency now covers 41 of 58 counties, containing 30 percent of California's nearly 40 million people. House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy sets a vote for Wednesday for removing Congresswoman Liz Cheney from her Republican leadership post, saying it's clear that he and his Republican colleagues need to make a change. Cheney all but certain to go after repeatedly challenging Donald Trump's false assertions, pinning his November re-election defeat on widespread voting fraud. The U.S. expanding the use of Pfizer their BioNTech's vaccine to children 12 years old and up, and the FBI confirms that the criminal hacking group DarkSide is responsible for a ransomware attack on one of the largest oil pipelines on the East Coast. From Pacifica Radio, KPFA Berkeley, KPFK Los Angeles, this is the Evening News. I'm Mark Miracle. The Hamas militant group today launched a rare rocket strike on Jerusalem after hundreds of Palestinians were hurt in clashes with Israeli police at an iconic mosque as tensions in the holy city pushed the region closer to a full-fledged war. Israel responded with airstrikes across the Gaza Strip, where 20 people, including nine children, were killed in fighting. It was a long day of anger and deadly violence that laid bare Jerusalem deep divisions, even as Israel tried to celebrate its capture of the city's eastern Palestinian sector and its sensitive holy sites more than half a century ago, with dozens of rockets flying into Israel throughout the night. Bell True is reporting for Jerusalem for the British newspaper The Independent. From what we understand, there were six long-range missiles that were fired from Gaza towards Jerusalem. We've had reports from the Israeli army that rocket sirens has all, have also gone off in, the, in southern Israel near the Gaza Strip in some of the key cities like Ashkelon. I understand that a few rockets have also been fired over the border from there. It's not very surprising as Hamas did uh, warn that if uh, the Israeli security forces had not left the Al-Aqsa compound in um, the old city by 6 p.m. they would escalate. The Israeli army said at least 150 rockets had been fired into Israel. That included a barrage of six rockets that targeted Jerusalem, setting off air raid sirens throughout the city. Explosions could be heard in what was believed to be the first time the city had been targeted since a war in 2014. Dozens of rockets were intercepted by Israel's Iron Dome missile defense system, but one landed near a home on the outskirts of Jerusalem, causing light damage to the structure and sparking a brush fire nearby. By late today, the Israeli military had carried out dozens of airstrikes across Gaza, targeting what it said were Hamas military installations and operatives. It said a Hamas tunnel, rocket launchers, and at least eight militants had been hit. 
Gaza health officials said at least 13 of 20 deaths in Gaza were attributed to the airstrikes. Seven of the deaths were members of a single family, including three children who died in a mysterious explosion in the northern Gaza town of Beit Hanun. It was not clear if the blast was caused by an Israeli airstrike or an errant rocket. The Palestinian rocket attacks on Israel came after Israeli police fired tear gas, stun grenades, and rubber-coated steel bullets at Palestinians in and around the Al-Ofska Mosque in East Jerusalem. It is one of Islam's holiest sites. Medics said more than 300 Palestinians were injured and more than 200 hospitalized. At least 21 police officers and seven Israeli civilians were also hurt. This Palestinian was praying in the mosque when police attacked. We were praying in the mosque. Suddenly the soldiers uh, located the mosque without any alert. They started to uh, uh, shoot the boy, uh, bombs and uh, there are many, dozens of injured, dozens of uh, people who were injured from the bomb here and the bullets. It's, it's amazing. Uh, this is a praying place, not for a uh, fight. The confrontation was the latest after weeks of mounting tensions between Palestinians and Israeli troops in the old city of Jerusalem. There have been almost nightly clashes during the Muslim holy month of Ramadan. Most recently, the tensions have been fueled by the planned eviction of dozens of Palestinians from the Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood of East Jerusalem where Israeli settlers have waged a lengthy legal battle to take over Palestinian homes and properties. Today was expected to be particularly tense since nationalist Israelis mark it as Jerusalem Day to celebrate the Israeli capture of East Jerusalem in the 1967 Mideast War. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said Israeli forces were upholding law and order. His remarks appeared on Al Jazeera. A struggle is taking place in the heart of Jerusalem. This is not a new struggle. This is a struggle between intolerance and tolerance, between law-breaking and violence and law and order. The struggle is not new because it has transpired over Jerusalem and in the heart of Jerusalem for centuries. Since the rise of the monotheistic religions, for years, one side ruled and excluded the two others. And sometimes they changed, and the same thing happened. You can say that in the long history of Jerusalem, only under Israeli sovereignty since 1967, we are witnessing a continuous, stable, secure period in which we are working to ensure freedom of worship and tolerance for all. I'm an Ode, a leading Palestinian politician in Israel, blamed the violence on Israel's discriminatory policies towards the Palestinians and said it had provoked the violence. Ode said, wherever you find occupation, you will find resistance. Palestinian Prime Minister Mohammed Shatea castigated Israel for its attack at Al-Aqsa and asked the United Nations for help. His remarks also appeared on Al Jazeera. I hold the Israeli government fully responsible for what the worshippers were exposed to in the blessed Al-Aqsa Mosque and I warn of the consequences that will result from such incursions as well as attempts to evacuate the people of Sheikh Jarrah, the original owners of the land from their homes. I call on the international community to intervene immediately to stop these horrific violations and to provide protection to the citizens of the Palestinian territories, especially in the city of Jerusalem, which is undergoing ethnic cleansing. Today, Jerusalem is restoring the glow of the cause. Phyllis Bennis, director of the New Internationalism Program at the Institute for Policy Studies in Washington, D.C., and author of Understanding the Palestinian-Israeli Conflict, a primer, spoke with host Philip Maldry on the Sunday show. The Israeli Supreme Court is set to issue its ruling on the legality of the, the dispossession of several hundred Palestinians from a neighborhood in occupied East Jerusalem where they have lived for decades, for 50, 60 years. Uh, it's about, I think, f- some 50-odd families. 
uh, that have lived there, you know, for several generations. And they are being, in some cases, Israeli settlers are just invading their houses, throwing them out physically, they're armed, and the Israeli police and military stand by and watch and protect the settlers. Uh, the, the chant, kill the Arabs, has been the favorite chant of these young thugs marching through Arab East Jerusalem. So it's a very, very dangerous moment. This began at the beginning of Ramadan. It's, there's a, a long tradition in, in Palestinian life um, that during Ramadan, in the evening when the iftar meal is served, which is right after the, when the, when the moon first appears. Uh, when the sun sets. I'm uh, sorry, when the sun, well, the sun sets, uh, I think it's, uh, it starts, no, you're right, it's when the sun sets, you're right. When the sun sets, uh, people gather for their, their meal to break the fast, and the tradition in Jerusalem is that people gather near what's known as the Damascus Gate to the old city, which has a, a kind of amphitheater style set of steps, very broad steps uh, leading down into the entrance to the old city, and people gather there to share their iftar meals, uh, and it's very festive, there's usually dancing, music, and this year, the police decided to ban people from, from that tradition, and that set off uh, a great deal of, of anger, and then the following night was the first of what became several uh, uh, times that these these uh, Zionist thugs came chanting kill the Arabs, kill the Arabs uh, into, this, into this area. So it's been a very, very tense time. There have been several hundred Palestinians that have been injured um, in, in the, by, by police. They've been using um, water cannons, they've been using rubber bullets, which of course are in fact fatal on some occasions, and particularly dangerous to people's eyes, which is what they seem to be aiming at this round. Uh, so it's a very dangerous time, and we'll see tomorrow. But if tradition holds, it's very likely that the uh, the the um, Israeli Supreme Court will uphold the ability of these settlers to simply take the homes that have been built uh, by Palestinian families in many cases. On the other hand, across East Jerusalem, uh, Israeli laws are being imposed to demolish houses that people have built because they were built without permits because Palestinians cannot get permits to build in East Jerusalem. So it's a, a horrific situation that's clearly designed to drive people out. This is a kind of ethnic cleansing. Phyllis Bennis, author of Understanding the Palestinian-Israeli Conflict, a primer. The Biden administration today called for restraint by both Palestinians and the Israeli government. State Department spokesman Ned Price. The United States condemns in the strongest terms the barrage of rocket attacks fired in Israel in recent hours. This is an unacceptable escalation. While we urge de-escalation on all sides... We also recognize Israel's legitimate right to defend itself and to defend its people and its territory. The escalation of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict comes after a controversial decision calling off the first Palestinian parliamentary elections in 15 years that had been scheduled for later this month. Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas canceled them, blaming Israel. Critics with this within his own Palestinian movement said Abbas canceled the elections because he feared losing them. Rami Al-Maghari reports from Gaza. In a televised speech, Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas said he wanted to hold parliamentary elections. But Abbas said Ezra's refusal to cooperate on allowing Palestinians in East Jerusalem to vote forced his hand. Ezra lays claim to all of Jerusalem a claim disputed by Palestinians and the international community. I want to hold elections in Jerusalem, like in Ramallah and the rest of the West Bank. I want to do it totally, including election campaigning. We told the Israelis that we wanted to dispatch the elections committee's head, Hannah Nasser. They responded that a lawyer should accompany Nasser to defend him as they would likely arrest him. So we decided not to send him. 
Abbas said Israel's stance would force him to postpone the elections until Israel allows them to be held in East Jerusalem. Palestinians consider East Jerusalem as the capital of a future Palestinian state. But other Palestinians, political parties and candidates rejected Abbas's explanation. Isam Hamad is an independent Gaza-based candidate who planned to run for parliament. Unfortunately, not holding the elections will deepen this problem. And I think the reaction of the people will not be easy to stand. And we, I think we in the very near future shall see uh, some sort of uh, riots in both places. People are no longer able to wait longer than the 15 years that they have suffered from the division and from the economic situation, especially in Gaza Strip. So I hope that something will come up soon with a new date for the election in order to calm the situation from going further. Uh, but let's wait and see. Dr. Basim Naim is head of Hamas's Council for International Relations. He also rejected Abbas's move. Naim suggests that Abbas's decision will actually help Israel delegitimize Palestinians in East Jerusalem, mainly by building more illegal settlements. The postponement will deprive the entire Palestinian people of the opportunity for reforms following 15 years of division. Gaza political commentator Dr. Mahmoud al ajrami says the real reason that Abbas cancelled the election was his fear that his Fatah faction might lose because of internal divisions. Currently, there are many candidates within the Fatah party itself, including the exiled leader Mohammed Dahalan and the Freedom Bloc, including two of the Fatah's executive members who are currently imprisoned. The charismatic leader, Marwan Bargoti and Nasir al qaedwa It is said widely believed that Bargoti will be a strong candidate for the presidency following the parliamentary elections, and Abbas fears him. I believe that Abbas' own bloc will come in fourth or fifth once the elections are held. Since Abbas first announced several months ago that elections would be held on May 22, 36 various parliamentary factions declared they would compete. Saad Nimr is the campaign manager for the Hariya or Freedom List of both Marwan Barghouti and Nasser al Qadwa. He rely a lot on the pressure coming from the European Union and other uh, uh, countries around the world to pressurize Israel to allow the Palestinians uh, to go ahead with the elections. But that was absolutely a big mistake to wait for the Israeli permission to do the elections. In the Gaza Strip, most Palestinians expressed disappointment in the delay. They hoped elections would bring change and economic reforms following 15 years of an Israeli siege and the political split between Hamas and Fatah. Iyas al is a 43-year-old Gaza resident and maker of herbal cleaners. We have waited during 15 years of siege, repression and corruption. With the announcement of elections, we had hope. Now we are frustrated with the announcement of a delay. But that hope for positive change was not shared by Tamadur Tambura. She's a university graduate who has been unemployed for the past couple of years. Personally, I was not hoping that elections would be held. We already suffer from political division. During his televised speech, Abbas said instead of elections, Palestinians should form a government of national consensus. Despite many efforts, the rival Fatah and Hamas parties have been unable to reach political agreement. Dr. Hossam al Dajani is a political analyst in Gaza. Al Dajani believes that the elections were cancelled, not just postponed. Making the elections hostage to the will of the Israeli occupation under the international community's failure to pressure Israel will perpetuate the status quo. 
This will hijack the Palestinian people's right to choose their own leaders. In 2006, the U.S., United Nations and European Union helped Palestinians hold legislative elections in eastern Jerusalem, the West Bank and Gaza. But in 2018, former President Trump recognized Jerusalem, including its eastern and western parts, as the unified capital of Israel. President Biden has shown no interest in revising the Trump move. For Pacifica Radio, KPFA, I am Rami El Mirari in Gaza. You're listening to the evening news on KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles, KFCF Fresno online at kpfa.org. California Governor Gavin Newsom today announced a massive relief package that will send historic tax rebates to Californians, along with new assistance for rent and utility payments. The package is a preview of parts of his final budget proposal that Newsom is to unveil on Friday, marking the start of final legislative budget action for the coming fiscal year. Christopher Martinez reports. Governor Gavin Newsom has announced what he calls his economic recovery package, a plan he says will help California emerge from the pandemic stronger than ever. At the center of the package is a tax rebate he says is the largest state tax rebate ever. Today, we're announcing $12 billion tax rebate to the people of the state of California earning up to $75,000. Let me put that in perspective. That tax rebate will impact just shy of 80% of all tax filers will get a direct stimulus check, will get a direct relief payment because of this announcement. Two-thirds of all Californians will benefit from this stimulus. The stimulus checks will amount to $600 per person, with an additional $500 to families with children. That rebate and other parts of the package are possible because of a state budget surplus. This time last year, we announced a $54.3 billion projected shortfall. Today, we are announcing a projected $75.7 billion budget surplus. It's a remarkable turnaround. We talked about California coming back. I made the point at the State of the State a number of months ago, California is not coming back. California is going to come roaring back. $75.7 billion operating budget surplus. Although the rebate is large, Newsom says that's not enough to make up for the impact of the pandemic and its related economic effects. There's also the matter of utility payments. So he has another announcement. So today we're announcing $2 billion of direct relief to pay down utility expenses to pay off water, gas, and electricity needs. $1 billion $1 billion of that $2 billion, specifically, we're proposing to be set aside to address the issue of water in this state. So this is not an insignificant announcement. The package also includes the largest renter assistant package of any state. Today, we'll be announcing our desire, our plan to double the rental assistance in the state of California with the goal of getting 100% of all the back rent paid and provide 100% support over the next few months to renters that have been directly impacted by this pandemic. $5.2 billion we're putting up to take care of rent payments. The surplus that makes the package possible comes from increased state revenues, not including the $26 billion the state will get in federal relief. That money will come with restrictions on how it can be spent, but Newsom says the state relief will do things the federal money can't do. Among them, helping some people who have been left out of other relief programs. There was one group of residents in this state uh, that did not dial home sick and weren't able to do a lot of as much distance uh, work as others. And those were our central workers, our frontline employees, uh, many of them in mixed status family, many of them without documentation. And they were left out of the federal supports. They will not be left out of the support coming from the state. 
The announcement has won praise from some Democrats and advocacy groups. Republicans, on the other hand, have given grudging praise together with some disparaging remarks. Republican Assemblymember James Gallagher of Yuba City in a release said he is generally supportive, but he called it the least Newsom could do, and he dubbed the relief payments Recall Refund. Republican former San Diego Mayor Kevin Faulkner, who is running for governor in the recall election, said the one-time refund is, in his words, pretty small when you consider the totality of his mismanagement. Republican businessman John Cox, also running for governor, issued a statement saying in part, pretty boy Gavin Newsom is making one-time payments to Californians to avoid being recalled. But Newsom says his announcement has nothing to do with the recall. It's just a gradual unveiling of his budget, as he's done in past years. In any event, this won't be the last announcement before he unveils his revised budget proposal on Friday. Recall or not, Newsom is sounding bullish on California. 275,000 jobs have been created in the last two months uh, in the state of California. 41% of America's jobs came out of the state of California in February. California is not just back. California is roaring back. Reporting for Pacifica Radio News KPFA, I'm Christopher Martinez. President Biden said today there's not much evidence people are turning down job offers to remain on unemployment. His comments came after disappointing April jobs numbers were released last week. Biden said the charge that Americans would rather collect benefits than work is a right-wing talking point. The line has been because of the generous unemployment benefits that it's a major factor in labor shortages. Americans want to work. Americans want to work. As my dad used to say, a job's about a lot more than a paycheck. It's about your dignity. The latest jobs report showed fewer jobs last month created than expected, 260,000 versus about a million. Some employers say that they're finding it difficult to find workers. Biden suggested workers are still skittish about COVID exposure on the job and recommended that employers offer competitive wages and safe workplaces to attract employees. I think the people who claim Americans won't work, even if they find a good and fair opportunity, underestimate the American people. So we'll insist that the law is followed with respect to benefits, but we're not going to turn our backs on our fellow Americans. We're also working to overcome all the barriers that may be making it harder for people to get back to work. Child care, getting vaccinated, getting schools open. The Treasury Department today launched a $350 billion program to distribute aid to state and local governments, giving the U.S. economy an added boost after the relative modest hiring in the month of April. The aid is part of President Biden's larger $1.9 trillion coronavirus relief package that became law in March. Administration officials said payments would begin to go out in the coming days to eligible governments, allowing state, local, territorial, and tribal officials to offset the economic damage from the coronavirus pandemic. State and local governments can use the money for public health expenses. They can also offset harm done from the downturn to workers, small businesses, and affected industries. Money can replace lost public sector revenues. Essential workers can qualify for premium pay, and investments can be made in water, sewer, and broadband internet. Biden said his administration is releasing guidance to states to allow a dramatic expansion of child care. He said the assistance will allow hundreds of thousands of providers who were forced to close their doors to reopen and stay open for 5 million children. 800,000 families will receive subsidies to pay for child care. House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy today set a Wednesday vote for removing Congresswoman Liz Cheney from her Republican leadership post in the chamber, saying it was clear that he and his GOP colleagues need to make a change. McCarthy made the remarks today in a letter to Republican lawmakers that did not mention Cheney or former President Donald Trump by name. 
Cheney seems all but certain to be tossed from the number three House Republican job after repeatedly challenging Trump's false assertions pinning his November re-election defeat on widespread voting fraud. She's also criticized his role in inciting his supporters to attack the Capitol on January 6th as electoral votes were being formally certified by Congress. And she was among just 10 Republicans to support the House's vote to impeach him the following week. McCarthy has signaled his desire to remove Cheney for several weeks. Representative Elise Stefanik of New York, who came to Congress as an occasional Trump critic but has embraced him over the past two years, seems likely to replace her, though McCarthy might delay the vote on that to the following week. Speaking on Fox News, McCarthy said he supports Stefanik for the job of Republican conference chair. Everyone in leadership serves at the pleasure of the conference. And as you know, there is a lot at stake. Democrats are destroying this nation. We've watched the greatest expansion of government in this socialist liberal agenda. To defeat Nancy Pelosi in this socialist agenda, we need to be united. And that starts with leadership. That's why we will have a vote uh, next week. And we want to be united in looking moving forward. And I think that's what will take place. Trump reiterated his support for Stefanik in a statement today, citing her support from the National Rifle Association and the union representing Border Patrol agents. Cheney has been unrelenting in her criticism of Trump and those who support his false claims of a stolen presidential election. In an opinion essay last week in the Washington Post, she denounced what she called the dangerous and anti-democratic Trump cult of personality and warned her fellow Republicans against embracing or ignoring his statements for fundraising and political purposes. She also took on McCarthy pointing out he had changed his story after initially saying that Trump bears responsibility for the January 6th attack on the Capitol. McCarthy now says he does not believe Trump provoked the insurrection. You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles, KFCF Fresno. It's an hour-long newscast airing each night at 6 with a half-hour edition on the weekends. I'm Mark Miracle. A House of Representatives committee today again took up that deadly January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol by a mob of Trump supporters. It's the third hearing on the event. The hearing comes as congressional leaders are discussing the formation of a bipartisan commission to investigate the insurrection. Max Pringle reports. California Democrat Zoe Lofgren chairs the House Committee on Administration. She quoted an open letter sent to the government from a Capitol Police officer who was beaten by the mob and tased with his own taser until he suffered a heart attack. She said it summed up the seriousness of the events of that day. I struggled daily with the emotional anxiety of having survived such a traumatic event, but I also struggled with the anxiety of hearing those who continue to downplay the events of that day and those who would ignore them altogether with their lack of acknowledgement. His letter is a stark reminder of the plain facts of the events of that day. His attackers were not foreign terrorists, they were his fellow Americans, incited to insurrection and violence by the then President of the United States. The committee heard about the readiness of the Capitol Police amid warnings of expected trouble from Capitol Police Inspector General Michael Bolton. He said a lack of communication about these threats left the officers unprepared. Among other recommendations, Bolton said an independent threat assessment operation needs to be integrated into the Capitol Police Department. A standalone entity with a defined mission dedicated to counter-surveillance activities in support of protecting the congressional community would improve the department's ability to identify and disrupt individuals or groups intent on engaging in illegal activity directed at the congressional community or its legislative process. And Bolton said the Capitol Intelligence Unit would need to be properly funded and staffed to do its job right. The entity should be sufficiently staffed to accomplish its mission and have adequate resources including dedicated analyst support and a central desk to exploit, investigative, disseminate, and triage information in real time. 
A report from Bolton in March found multiple deficiencies and the department's failure to share intelligence from as early as last December that suggested protesters heading to the Capitol on January 6th may become violent. According to Bolton, the department also disseminated conflicting intelligence information in the days leading up to the Capitol insurrection. Congressional leaders are continuing to negotiate an independent commission to investigate January 6th. Meanwhile, architect of the Capitol Inspector General Chris Valia is scheduled to testify on Wednesday. For KPFA News, I'm Max Pringle. Lafayette Square, the park across from the White House, has reopened to the public nearly a year after federal authorities fenced off the area at the height of nationwide protests over the police killings of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. Protesters were ejected from the square shortly before then-President Trump walked across the park to stand near St. John's Church to pose for the cameras with a Bible which he held upside down. The United States is expanding the use of Pfizer-BioNTech's vaccine to children 12 years old and up. The Food and Drug Administration said today the shot is safe and offers strong protection for younger teens based on testing of more than 2,000 U.S. volunteers. Shots could begin soon once a federal vaccine panel issues recommendations for using the vaccine in 12 to 15 year olds. Vaccinating children of all ages will be critical for a return to normalcy. Most vaccines rolling out worldwide have been authorized for adults. Medical experts say coronavirus infections are likely spreading in India's northeastern state of Assam faster than anywhere else in the country. Local authorities are preparing for a surge in infections by converting a massive stadium and a university into hospitals. Prime Minister Narendra Modi and opposition politicians held massive super-spreader rallies ahead of recent elections in Assam state and elsewhere throughout India. The virus has also started spreading into more remote Himalayan villages with poor health infrastructure These areas are home to indigenous tribes whose area already faced some of the lowest access to health care in the nation. More from Ishan Garg in New Delhi. On Monday, India tested 1.4 million people, half a million fewer than were tested just a week ago. The federal government says it has eased testing to reduce burden on labs. Experts warn that cases could peak in the next two weeks when India could record close to 800,000 cases, but only if adequate testing is conducted. Many states continue to grapple with a lack of oxygen, beds and medicines. Authorities say they are procuring supplies rapidly. Pressures mounting on Prime Minister Narendra Modi to impose a nationwide lockdown. But the government has resisted the move, fearing the economic fallout, and has instead asked states to impose local restrictions as they deem fit. Ishan Garg, New Delhi. In less than a week, people in England will be able to give someone outside their household bubble a hug. For the first time since restrictions were put in place in March of last year, when the coronavirus was running rampant. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson confirmed that he has given the go-ahead for that much-missed human contact from May 17th as part of the next round of lockdown easing following a sharp fall in new coronavirus infections. Other easing measures included the reopening of pubs and restaurants indoors, as well as cinemas and hotels and allowing two households to meet up inside a home. Laura Macon Isherwood reports from London on the Prime Minister's announcement. If confirmed, this latest step in the government's plan to move out of lockdown would return further normalities to daily life. From May the 17th, pubs and restaurants could be allowed to serve food and drink indoors, and overnight stays at homes other than one's own could get the go-ahead too, as UK infection rates hit their lowest level since September last year. Prime Minister Boris Johnson will host a televised press conference later to set out the next stage of his government's roadmap. After a year of families having to spend time apart, there could be guidance too on how to return to close contact safely. Laura Megan Isherwood, London. It's not clear when a major fossil fuel pipeline system will begin operating again or if its operator is paying a ransom. Colonial Pipeline acknowledged this weekend that it has fallen victim to a ransomware attack 
and had halted all pipeline operations to deal with the threat. Colonial says it's responsible for delivering roughly 45% of all fuel consumed on the East Coast. It transports gasoline, diesel, jet fuel, and home heating oil from refineries located on the Gulf Coast through pipelines running from Texas to New Jersey. Its pipeline system spans more than 5,500 miles, transporting more than 100 million gallons a day. Deputy National Security Advisor Elizabeth Sherwood Randall. Colonial is currently working with its private cybersecurity consultants to assess potential damage and to determine when it is safe to bring the pipeline back online. Thus far, Colonial has told us that it has not suffered damage and can be brought back online relatively quickly, but that safety is a priority given that it has never before taken the entire pipeline down. Colonial says it hopes to be resuming its full operations by the end of the week. The cyber attack is believed to have been carried out by a group known as Dark Side. Dark Side claims that it does not attack hospitals and nursing homes, educational or government targets, and that it donates a portion of the ransom it gets to charity. It's been active since August. Experts say it avoids targeting organizations in former Soviet bloc nations. The Justice Department has a new task force dedicated to countering ransomware attacks. Biden administration national security official Ann Neuberger. The FBI identified the ransomware as the dark side variant, which they've been investigating since October of last year. It's a ransomware as a service variant, where criminal affiliates conduct attacks and then share the proceeds with the ransomware developers. Food and Water Watch director Winona Hauter said the shutdown of the Colonial Pipeline just the latest in a long litany of examples of why the United States must urgently transition off highly vulnerable and dangerous fossil fuel networks. Governor Gavin Newsom today expanded a drought emergency declaration to a large swath of the nation's most populated state amid acute water supply shortages in northern and central parts of California. The declaration now covers 41 of 58 counties, covering 30 percent of Californians' nearly 40 million people. The U.S. Drought Monitor shows most of the state and the American West is in extensive drought, just a few years after California emerged from a punishing multi-year dry spell. Officials fear an extraordinarily dry spring presages a wildfire season like last year, when flames burned a record of 6,600 square miles. The expansion comes as Newsom prepares to propose more spending on both short- and long-term responses to dry conditions. He was set to release details during a visit to Merced County in the agricultural Central Valley south of Sacramento. The Democratic governor last month had declared an emergency in just two counties north of San Francisco, Mendocino and Sonoma. The expanded declaration includes the counties in the Klamath River, Sacramento-San Joaquin Delta, and Tulare Lake watersheds across much of the northern and central parts of the state. The Sierra Nevada snowpack, which provides about a third of the state's water, was at just 59% of average on April 1st, when it's normally at its peak. The Newsom administration said this year is unique because of extraordinarily warm temperatures in April and May. That led to quick melting of the Sierra Nevada snowpack and the waterways that feed the Sacramento River, which in turn supplies much of the state's summer water supply. The administration said the problem was worse because much of the snow seeped into the ground instead of flowing into rivers and reservoirs. The warmer temperatures also caused water users to draw more water more quickly than even in other drought years, leaving the reservoirs extremely low for farmers, fish, and wildlife that depend on them. Meanwhile, the National Weather Service extended a red flag fire warning until 6 p.m. tomorrow for the north and East Bay Hills, as well as the interior valleys of the San Francisco East Bay, due to hot temperatures, low humidity, and strong offshore winds. Forecasters say the most dangerous time 
<laughs> will be the overnight hours of this evening into tomorrow morning, when another burst of strong offshore winds will affect the hills. May is Wildfire Awareness Month, and the western United States is preparing for an active year. Eric Takatoff has that story. Coming off a severe wildfire season where nine Oregonians were killed and 40,000 were displaced, preventing fires is on the minds of many in the state. Kristen Babs is head of the group Keep Oregon Green. Over 70% of Oregon's wildfires are started by people, and that places the power of prevention squarely in our hands. Public land saw large crowds last summer, and land managers expect to see those same high numbers again this year. Babs says people should keep fire restrictions in mind before heading out. Near their homes, she advises people to keep close watch on their debris burns and be careful when using machinery such as lawnmowers that could overheat and spark dry grasses. Nearly the entire state is abnormally dry, and more than three-quarters is experiencing moderate drought or higher. Babs says there already have been fires. At the end of March, for instance, nearly 200 homes in Bend were evacuated because of a brush fire. Babs says fire restrictions may be in effect depending on where folks are in the state. Whether folks are at home or on the job or they're out having fun, predict the outcome of any outdoor activity that could possibly spark a wildfire. Predictable is preventable. Keep Oregon Green has a map on its website of current fire conditions and restrictions across the state. Climate scientists note droughts and severe wildfire seasons are becoming more frequent as temperatures rise from climate change. For Oregon News Service, I'm Eric Tegadoff. And you are listening to the Evening News on KPFA Berkeley, KPFK, Los Angeles, KFCF Fresno, online at kpfa.org. This is Kat Brooks. I'm an actor, activist, and freedom fighter. And I'm Brian Edwards Teekert. I mostly do journalism, which kind of sounds boring now. And together, we host Upfront, KPFA's local two-hour morning magazine. We bring you breaking news, debates, deep dives. Reporting on City Hall and the State House. Housing and transportation. Prisons and police. And everything big that happened while you were sleeping. And it means the two of us get to hang out with you at 7 a.m. right after Democracy Now! on Upfront. The Biden administration says the government will protect gay and transgender people against discrimination in health care. That reverses a Trump-era policy that sought to narrow the scope of legal rights in certain situations involving medical care. The action by Health and Human Services Secretary Javier Becerra affirms that federal laws forbidding sex discrimination in health care also protect gay and transgender people. The Trump administration had defined sex to mean gender assigned at birth, thereby excluding transgender people from the law's umbrella of protection. In his statement reversing Trump policy, Becerra said that fear of discrimination can lead individuals to forego care, which can have serious negative health consequences. Becerra said that everyone, including LGBTQ people, should be able to access health care free from discrimination or interference. Consumer and business groups are speaking out in favor of California legislation to create an agency dedicated to cutting health care costs. Suzanne Potter reports. AB 1130 from Assemblymember Jim Wood would establish a state office of health care affordability. The agency would have the power to set cost targets for health plans, hospitals, and more, and to enforce them. Bill Barcelona with America's Physician Groups says experts are needed to ferret out where, how, and why the marketplace is failing patients. You have to have someone at the top of the system looking at the data, finding the gaps, and driving innovation, and on the negative side, driving compliance. Opponents object to what they see as more government intervention in the health care marketplace. According to the California Health Care Foundation, costs for California families who get health care through their jobs have jumped 142 percent in recent years, far outpacing the growth of median household income. Rhonda Smith with California Black Health Network says the U.S. health care system is broken. We spend the most on health care costs and we have the worst outcomes. We spend more on hospitalization than any other developed nation. And we have the worst life expectancy at birth than any other developed nation. 
The new agency would look at moving to a new system of payments that rewards providers when they improve patient outcomes instead of the current fee-for-service model that encourages volume. Anthony Wright with the nonprofit advocacy group Health Access says the current system sets costs primarily based on the potential for profit rather than effectiveness or equity. The price is not necessarily based on the best quality or outcomes, but is based on what the market can bear. The bill is in the Appropriations Committee. Its backers are asking for $11.2 million to fund the agency for the first year. They say they're optimistic that Governor Gavin Newsom will include the funding in his budget update due in a week. For California News Service, I'm Suzanne Potter. States across the country are calling on Facebook to drop the idea of an Instagram service catering to children under the age of 13. Forty-four attorneys general from states and U.S. territories have signed on to a letter to Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg urging him to drop the idea. They said... Children that young could be susceptible to online bullying, cyberbullying, and the negative mental health effects of social media like depression. Children under 13 are technically not allowed to use the Instagram app in its current form due to federal privacy regulations. But Facebook in March confirmed a report by BuzzFeed News saying that it's exploring a parent-controlled experience on Instagram. No group claiming responsibility for the deadly attack on a girls' school in the Afghan capital that killed 58 people, many of them girls between the ages of 11 and 15. More than 100 were injured in the weekend attack. The Taliban denied responsibility and condemned the attack. Three explosions outside the school entrance struck as students were leaving for the day. The blast occurred on a, in a mostly Shiite neighborhood in the west of the capital. The area has been hit by brutal attacks targeting minority Shias and most often claimed by the self-styled Islamic State affiliate operating in Afghanistan. Families buried their loved ones yesterday and blamed the government for failing to provide security. Our message to the government is that they should ensure our peace and security. Also, our message to the blind-hearted enemy is that there are so many incidents in Kabul that they should stop the violence and accept peace and stability. Until when will we bury the dead bodies? Our government officials only apologize and show sympathy, which doesn't cure pain. The Taliban today announced a three-day ceasefire for the Muslim holiday of Eid al-Fitr that marks the end of the holy month of Ramadan. Hours later, a roadside bombing killed 11 passengers on a bus in eastern Afghanistan. No one claimed responsibility for that attack. Scotland's leader is telling British Prime Minister Boris Johnson that a second Scottish independence referendum is a matter of when and not if after her Scottish Nationalist Party won its fourth straight parliamentary election. Johnson has invited the leaders of the UK's devolved nations for crisis talks on the union after the regional election results rolled in, saying the UK was best served when they worked together and that the devolved governments in Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland should cooperate on plans to recover from the coronavirus pandemic. Simon Marks reports. The situation in Scotland after local elections that saw the Scottish National Party secure a fourth term in government with a pro-independence majority of members of the Scottish Parliament. On Sunday night, Scotland's First Minister Nicola Sturgeon says she told Prime Minister Boris Johnson that a second referendum on independence is now a matter of when, not if. Journalist Magnus Linklater is a former editor of The Scotsman. There will be a majority in the Parliament for a second referendum And who knows, uh, the tussle is now with Boris Johnson. Boris has said no, absolutely not. Now is not the time. Uh, Nicola Sturgeon, to be fair, is also saying now is not quite the time. She says we've got to beat COVID first uh, and only then will she turn to the possibility of getting a second referendum. uh, And that will be what? 
two to three years, something like that. It's been seven years since Scots rejected independence in what was called at the time a once-in-a-generation referendum on the issue. The possibility of a rerun continues to hang over Scottish politics and over the rest of the UK. Simon Marks reporting. Former California Supreme Court Justice Cruz Reynoso has died at the age of 90. Reynoso was the son of migrant farm workers who labored in the fields as a child and went on to become the first Latino state Supreme Court justice in California history. In a legal career that spanned six decades, Reynoso played a vital role in the movement to uplift farm workers in California and guided many students of color toward a career in law. In a speech at UC Davis six years ago, Reynoso noted California's racial diversity. The majority of the state's population is Latino, Asian, American, and black. He said the state needed to set an example for the rest of the country, which is also undergoing, becoming increasingly diverse. We were involved, I think, in a great experiment, we in California, to see whether or not that mixture of people and languages can, in, can indeed uh, work together and, and yet have a common sense of community, a common sense of what we hope for, 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 for all of us. Uh, and and it's, 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 not, it's not easy. And yet, as I see it, the whole country that is, we are a precursor of, the whole, of what, what the whole country was gonna, is going to look like in 20, 30, or 40 years. So we have to make, it seems to me that we have to make it succeed. We have, we have to, to make sure that, in fact, we have the social welfare and, 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 and a, a successful state to be able to tell the rest of the United States of America that we can succeed as a nation, we can have a common core that, that we believe in of, of, what's, of what's, in, what's important. But that has to be done, I think, with, with understanding, having a goal of understanding, with dignity for one another, and with care for, 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 for one another. As director of California Rural Legal Assistance, CRLA, the first statewide federally funded legal aid program in the country in the late 1960s, Reynoso led efforts to ensure farm workers access to sanitation facilities in the fields and to ban the use of the carcinogenic pesticide DDT. After leaving CRLA in 1972, Reynoso taught law before he was appointed to the state's third district appellate court in Sacramento. In 1982, Governor Jerry Brown appointed Reynoso to the state Supreme Court, the first Latino to be named to the state's high court. He became the target of a recall campaign led by proponents of the death penalty, who painted him, Chief Justice Rose Byrd, and Associate Justice Joseph Grodin as being soft on crime. The three were removed from the high court in 1987. After leaving the bench, he practiced and taught law at UCLA and UC Davis and served on the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights and the United Nations Commission on Human Rights. He received the Presidential Medal of Freedom from President Bill Clinton in 2000. Cruz Reynoso dead at the age of 90. The faculty union at City College of San Francisco over the weekend agreed to salary reductions to save classes and jobs at the beleaguered community college. The CCSF Board of Trustees were to meet to decide this afternoon whether to rescind the layoff notices it had issued to 163 tenured or tenure track faculty. Their union, the AFT 2121, said the agreement provides an important dose of relief for its members and the college, but is not a long term solution to what it calls the chronic underfunding of the City College of San Francisco. And once again, repeat, the National Weather Service has extended its red flag fire warning for the San Francisco Bay Area until 6 p.m. tomorrow. That's for the North and East Bay Hills as well as the interior valleys of the East Bay. Sunny tomorrow in the San Francisco Bay Area with highs in the upper 60s around the bay. Continued hot further inland with 
highs in the low 90s under sunny skies. Sunny in the central San Joaquin Valley tomorrow. Continued hot with highs in the mid 90s. Partly cloudy in Los Angeles with highs in the mid 70s. That's it for the news tonight for this Monday, May 10th. Thanks for joining us. I'm Mark Miracle. Good evening. In Monday nights starting at 7 p.m. with Africa Today, a weekly program providing information and analysis about Africa and the African diaspora, hosted by Walter Turner. At 8 p.m., it's a soul sonic rhapsody of word, sound, and power on transitions on traditions, hosted and produced by Greg Bridges. Then at 10 p.m., eclectic beats and rhythms take you into Tuesday with Off the Beaten Path. Featuring weekly rotating hosts. That's Monday nights on 94.1 FM, KPFA, and KPFA.org. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz, and online worldwide at KPFA.org.